if you'll all stand with me. Do we have somebody that could hand him a wireless mic to Chris Chung over there? Oh, you already have it? Okay, can somebody hand him a wireless mic? He's my responsive reader for the day. And if you, the rest of you will all stand with me for the public reading of God's Word. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 through 14, reading from the NIV. I'll read verses, uh, the even verses. You'll read the odd ones. The last one we'll read together. And if you'll go, if you'll go ahead and, uh, David, if you'll skip this to the, okay, good. Here we go. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you altogether. But if you do, do not, not forgive, forgive others men, their sins, sins, your Father, Father will, will not, not forgive, forgive your sins. sins. This is the word of the Lord. Dear precious Father, we thank you for gathering us here on this Sunday to hear a message uh, about your kingdom and about uh, just what kind of a king we serve um, and what it means to be in your kingdom. We ask, Lord, that the message would be clear and that each and every one of us would be changed, altered by the message. Help us pay attention and... and uh, and let the speaker have command of the message to, to really, really have our attention. And uh, we ask that all of this will be made possible by the fullness of the Holy Spirit in this place. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. And if you do me a favor, you're kind of scattered, and so I have to do a lot of this. If you would gather just a little bit more. You don't have to come all the way to the front. Just a, just a little bit more towards this general area in the middle. I promise not to projectile speak. There'll be no spittle going all the way there. If you just move a little bit towards the middle. I know the wall is comfortable. We like to lean. Uh, just a little bit, just a tiny bit. Just imagine we're like a, 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 a team, and the coach says, let's huddle up. This is halftime, and we're going to go. This is good. Thank you. It's a great pleasure and privilege to preach before you today. Uh, today and next few Sundays, we'll be hearing a message in a three-part series about the kingdom of God. It's a very uh, uh, a familiar concept. I mean, when we hear the kingdom of God, we've heard this a lot. You've heard it preached numerous times. I remember when Pastor Jason preached to uh, Chris and Sean, you know, uh, and you guys about the kingdom of God when, I, when he was still there. But if, uh, if someone was to ask me, what did Jesus come to preach? What did he preach? Because he didn't surely go around preaching himself. He didn't preach himself. But the answer, my answer would be the kingdom of God. That's, that is what he preached. He not only came to preach the kingdom of God, but he came to inaugurate it. He was the one who came to set its course in motion. And uh, when we say the word kingdom, this day and age, it's kind of a foreign concept. It's not too familiar with us. The best way for us to be kind of a, to be able to like really think about what a kingdom is, it may be in your reference to fairy tales or movies or even history books. Uh, you may have like pictures of knights in armor. Have you, how many of you been to medieval times over here? In, uh, have, you, have anybody been to medieval times? Right. I've been there once. It's super expensive nowadays, but they have like jousting, knights, you know, with sword fights, right? When we say king, kingdom, these are the images that kind of pop into our minds, right? One of the, some of the uh, famous fictitious kings that we know about, when I, when I asked the youth group, they gave me an answer. Is there like a fictitious king's name that you know? Not a real king, but from a novel. Any kings come to your mind? King Arthur, everybody, yeah. He, they said King Arthur. We know King Aragorn from, never heard of King Aragorn? Anybody know Lord of the Rings? You've seen the movie, right? King Aragorn, he was like the good... <laughs> okay. So, um, 
in the okay, 21st century in the United States, the concept of kingdom not too familiar. In the Bible, we see King David, King Solomon, and then we generally put them in the past of our history. We don't really we don't really think about it, even though they exist today. Kings exist today. There is actually monarchies. And uh, it is also true that we don't even have to go that far. United Kingdom, you know what that is, right? The Great Britain is actually a, it's still a monarchy in effect. It's a, it's a commonwealth monarchy, but it is one that is headed by not a king, but a queen, Queen Elizabeth, one of the longest reigning monarchs in British history since 1952. When, you know the Brits, when the Brits say, long live the queen? I mean... This, this long-lived queen hailing has actually had some effects. She's still alive, and she's still reigning. North Korea, although it calls itself a, people's, a democratic, democratic People's Republic of Korea, it is not at all democratic. It is not governed by the people, but it's in fact headed by its prime minister, Kim Jong-un, in what is known as a totalitarian dictatorship, and in one of the worst of its kind. The political reality of North Korea looks more like an absolute monarchy, a kingdom of the Kim dynasty, which started with uh, their grandfather, Kim Il-sung. And uh, monarchy meanings, it's, it's a combined word. Mono means one. You guys know from stereo channel and mono, right? Mono means one. Arco means to rule. So monarchy means being ruled by a single person with supreme power, and kingdom, in the most basic definition, is a territory that is ruled by a king. Now, in the United States where we live, of course, our political, our political governance is a more truly democratic republic. We actually have people that vote the people we want in office to represent us, right? And... Uh, and uh, and this, this began in the 1700s in our history as a result of moving away from a monarchy. We didn't, they didn't like, the early fathers didn't like the idea of one singular power and authority to have that much power over the people. I mean, just imagine how much power a person wields. If I was king, to be able to say, off with this head, an execution not, not requiring really a true jury or, a, or a, 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 you know, a whole supreme judgment court, just, you know, the king himself being able to decree that kind of a thing. So, now here's a question that I, I, I want to ask you guys to sort of make this quasi-interactive. I'm curious of your opinions. How many of you would like the option of going back to a monarchy? We have a constitutional democratic government here in the United States. How many of you think... Yeah, what the heck, you know, let's go back to the monarchy because it might make things kind of interesting, you know. I'm willing to venture even before like seeing your eyes, you know, in agreement or shaking your heads that uh, you would find it undesirable, that you would think that it's just un totally undesirable for a single supreme ruler to govern our territory. We're too used, we're far too used to the idea that our individual voice matters and we want to be important in this society. We want to be heard. We want to have a say in those decisions that go up there, right? So, you know, chances are we're not down for, we're not really down for the, the monarchy. But I want you to keep that thumb in your, in your question, imaginary thumb in your mind, as I guide us through our text. Um, you might be kind of scratching your head, geez, you know, Pastor Charlie, didn't we already hear a sermon on Jesus' prayer? We already did the Lord's Prayer. Why are we doing it again? But um, we're looking at the Matthew's version. The last time we looked at the Luke's version. Jesus is telling us, and when you do pray, to do it in secret to our Father who is unseen. One of the features of the God we serve is that He is spirit, so He is not seen. Because He is spirit, He can be in all places at the same time, right? There's a, in a classical teaching of, of our theology, one thing that we know about God is that He's omnipresent. He's, he's, he's here right now, as well as He's, he's there in, uh, in Africa when the people are coming together to worship the name. So it is true that when we gather together uh, as a church and pray in public, 
that I sometimes pray lengthy prayers. Since I'm praying for the rest of the body, that I will do the lengthy prayers. But Jesus says, when it comes to your personal relationship with God, do it alone. Do it in, in secret. Not because... Not because he doesn't know what we're going to ask him and that we should ask those things in secret, but because this activity of the Lord's prayer is actually to conform to God's will, conform ourselves to God's will, not to inform God on our will. This is what Jesus says. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. In any relationship in in a household, you know a household is running really well? when even before a member of the household asks for something, but it gets done. There's some routine, established routine, and it's like, and you know that the necessity is there, so even before somebody raises an issue or asks, it gets done. The will gets done. Like, for example, I don't know how my track record is back in the olden days when I first married my wife. I'm sure these days there are a lot of things that are on cruise control because she doesn't have to ask me, can you please do the dishes? Can you please take the trash? If it's there, you know, and if it's like piling up, I'll just take it out. It becomes automatic, right? Our Father is like that too. Uh, God knows what we need before we ask Him. It's not just what we want. A lot of times, we will inform God, God, you know, we want this, we want this. But uh, He knows what we want. Better yet, He knows what we need. Sometimes they're in conflict with each other. We think we want this. We think we want that person to be our spouse. We think we want that job over there. We think we want those fanciful dreams that we have. But uh, later on, uh, we come to realize that it's sometimes, oftentimes, different than what we need. So Jesus says, when you pray, don't, don't say it in like lengthy things. But, you know, just, just address. Address what, what these things are. And what it does is that it discloses, it reveals to us a picture of what the kingdom of God is who our king is, his nature, and the kingdom of God. So we're going to examine that today, what the Lord's prayer discloses about the kingdom of God in reference to us in our relationship with him. So he teaches us to address God by the title Father, one of the more intimate uh, people that we know. I don't know how close you are to your dads, but when you're calling God your father, we're talking about the creator of the universe as we know it, All the astrophysicists in the modern advancements of science are still groping at the edge. We don't have the the mechanism. We don't have the technology. We don't have the science that's sophisticated enough to to understand the outer edge of its limits. All we can do is speculate and fathom. That's how vast this universe is. And the person who has created this, we get to call her dad by virtue of Jesus. Jesus adopting us into that family, into that divine family in the household of the kingdom of God. For God, your Father, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This is the first distinction that I want you to take away from us today. In the kingdom of God, our King is good. The Father already knows what we need. In a human kingdom, the King is going to make demands on us. The King will demand tributes. The King will demand like your allegiance and loyalty, and sometimes the best of your finest of your, of your, of your fields and your, and your uh, crops, right? But in this case, the situation is reversed. He knows our needs before we ask him, and he provides for them. He, God, uh, Jesus encourages us to, to voice these needs to, to God because he's our king. Whenever you're in any kind of a situation, if you will have an allegiance to the kingdom of God, I want you to keep your eyes open and beware of a kingless kingdom. Beware of a kingless kingdom. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So this is the first premise of the kingdom of God, that there is a will of the king, that is decreed throughout the, throughout the land. Anybody who would have the allegiance to, to, this, to this king, who would be in this kingdom, right, is dedicated, consecrated to doing his will. Now, by the time uh, Jesus arrived into the history of Israel, Israel had already known many kings. I already mentioned David and Solomon. David was like a really good king, right? 
even though he was not a perfect king, he had made a mistake. I mean, he had committed a very, a pretty heinous sin, honestly. Like what he committed was not just one sin, but like a concatenation, a chain of sins. And uh, it was really bad. But yet he was still heralded as, as one, of their, one of their stars, one of their star uh, kings. But previous to the monarchy, when you go back to the Old Testament, before the kings were set into the place, you know who judged the tribes of Israel were judges. They were the ones that were this messianic type, their heroes. Whenever Israel would get into trouble because they were at disarray, because they were in, in disorder because of disobedience, they were on, always like threatened and uh, under vulnerability of outside attack. God would raise these judges, and they would, they would be the savior of that time. The word Mashiach applies to those situations when they had this trouble. They had the, the chaos and the trouble. God would raise them to, to, save, to, to save the day, to, so to speak. One of the people that come to my mind is, if I say judges, can you, think, can you name one judge? You got, who? Jeannie, my wife, yeah, just, just uh, Judge Judy. Oh, that's another joke. Okay, uh, I thought you you meant my wife. She she served as a temp, she served as a temporary judge for Orange County, but but yeah, Judge Judy. I'm talking about judges in the Old Testament. There's a there's a, a Gideon. Gideon's one of the judges, and one 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 of the judges that we will know well know well. Actually, Joshua was probably one of the judges, right? Jo- no, actually, Joshua's before the judges. So uh, Gideon or Samson. Remember Samson, the one with the long hair, very strong. Holy Spirit filled, was able to annihilate a vast army of people just with the, a jawbone of a donkey, right? Now, because they were under constant attack, Israelites were starting to covet the kingship of other nations. The Israelites are looking at other, other nations and, and they're, they're constantly under attack, so they're like tired of it. They're like, man, why are we all, always under attack? They're not seeing that. They have God as their king. God is ruling them. If only they were alert to his teachings and his guidance, they would not have been under attack. But because they're constantly under attack, because of their own sinfulness, they covet the, 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 neighbors, the neighbor's kings and then say, we want a king too. And so he, they make a request to Samuel and says, please uh, appoint for us a king too. You know, And uh, Samuel is like, God, God is telling... God is telling Samuel, this is not a good thing that they're asking because what happens once you appoint a king, they will demand uh, that the, the sons and daughters will be constrict, conscripted to, to labor forces like the, the king's military, king's army. They have to work the, for the chariots and they have to give up their lands and fields. The best fields and orchards would have to be taken from, by the king as tribute and then it would be given and distributed to their important officials. And uh, this is the reality of a human king in a human kingdom. But be that as it may, that was a preference of the people. The people wanted a strong man to be their ruler. Look at what the, God says to the prophet. And the Lord said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 8, 7, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. This is God speaking. God is seeing what they desire and saying, and he's acquiescing. You know how we think that uh, God always says no? God doesn't always say no. He says yes more times than no. When he says, he just acquiesces, you know? He, God knows that it would be much, much better for him, to, for him to deal with the people directly and to rule over them as their king. But if that's what the people want, they give it to him. First king being Saul, and then there's Ishbosheth, and then after that is uh, David rises to the throne, and then and then Solomon. That's under the U- United monarchy. Israel is under one one king, but then after Solomon, what happens? Israel gets divided into north and south, the Judah and uh, and Israel, right? Divided into two nations, and uh, by the time Jesus arrived, Israel was a client kingdom. Not an autonomous kingdom uh, in its own, but under the Roman Empire, which means that Israel, while they had their own king, they were expected to pay tribute to the Roman government, the Roman Empire. And uh, the person who was uh, the ruler during the time when Jesus arrived was Herod the Great. You guys remember that guy? 
Not a good man. He was a king that ordered the murder of all the, the male infants under the age of two in an attempt to prevent Jesus from assuming the throne. He heard from wise men who were traveling from the Far East to pay tribute to, to the new king of Israel. I mean, they're coming in with the news, and then they're like examining their books. Herod's like, what? There's a new king? You know, let me, let me find out. Please, when you find out where he's at, let me, let me know where, where he's at so I may tribute, pay tribute and worship him too. But of course, the plan was to try to uh, get rid of Jesus when he was just a baby. So there is a big difference between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. There are differences in, uh, in, the, in the qualitative differences, but mainly of his values. And uh, the, quali- the main, the chief qualitative difference between the kingdom of man versus the kingdom of, uh, of God is that one is delimited by physical territory and geographical markers. Like when you look at the map of, of the USA, that is our territorial boundary, right? And then maybe some islands and some other places. But the kingdom of God is not limited by that. The kingdom of God has its subjects as the people, as, as the main defining, defining outline of, of who the kingdom who the people of the kingdom belong to. We can have kingdom people in the United States, where it is the land of the free. And yet, we can have kingdom people secretly worshiping God in the the basement churches, in in the underground churches of North Korea, where the persecution is the harshest in the world. We can have kingdom people, kingdom of, of God, people in, in parts of, uh, of, of the most severely persecuting areas of, of the Hindu areas of India. We can have, we can have kingdom people uh, who can be severely, severely, and, and are constantly persecuted in the areas, in, in, in any of the Arabic regions, including Pakistan, which is on the top ten list of the most persecuted places where Christians exist today. So if the first point of today's message is that the kingdom of God is defined by its king, our king being the only good king ever in the world, being the very definition of what good is. The second qualitative characteristic, the second point of the message is, we know that the kingdom of God is transcendent. It's transcendent. It is not limited by physical boundaries. Uh, for the sake of convenience, for the sake of convenience, when we gather in a church, we confine ourselves to these four walls, to the sanctuary. Right? When you take a membership class, we say that I'm a member of Miracle Land Baptist Church. And that you are. We're part of the church. We're members of this body. But is the body of Christ only MBC? Absolutely not. The body of Christ is, is, is actually defined by the kingdom of God. Every single one of us who confess Jesus Christ as king and our Lord, we're in the kingdom of God. That's why we can have uh, works where we do like inter-church, inter-collaborative efforts. We have parachurches like KCCC where a lot of other people that belong to other churches gather together and do virtual mission like the one that Chris is in, in right now. When, uh, when we had, Mark just came back from, from Africa and he shared the testimony with the youth group people. Because of the reality of the kingdom of God, churches from vast different places and denominations and traditions like the Anglican Church of Africa and NBC can, can join efforts and do, do, do things together for the kingdom under our God. So second point, remember, kingdom of God is transcendent. First point, the kingdom, our king is good. Look at what Jesus says in Luke 17, verse 21. When asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, anticipating that it will come in the future in some visible way, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God will not come with observable signs, nor will people say, look, here it is, or there it is. For you see, the kingdom of God, God is in your midst. What he's saying at that time, when he's saying it, it's like it's already amongst you in your presence. Whoever has that anticipation of, king, of our God being the king that will rule over all our hearts, wherever people like that are gathered together, that is already, that is already the reality of the kingdom of God. Of course, there's a lot more than, than meets the eye when it comes to this. While Jesus was ministering, the people were guessing that Jesus must have been a, some kind of a revolutionary. You know, 
He gathers the people around and he's preaching from the mountains. These ideas are just radical ideas. Radical ideas. And he's teaching with some tremendous authority that they never heard before. And so some of their people that had political aspirations and interests, they think, they look at Jesus and go, here is our Che Guevara. Here is our, here is our guy that's going to be rising up an army and to overthrow Rome and reclaim the former glory of Israel. That's what they're looking at. They're looking at Jesus and they're going, man, you know. But of course, this is what Jesus says. What does Jesus say? He says, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom does not operate that way. In my kingdom, I, do not consc- I don't force people into to fighting my battles, right? In his kingdom, every single one of the subjects that want to serve him, we do it out of our own volition. We come to him because he's beautiful, he's majestic, because he has forgiven us, because he loves us, because he has demonstrated what that love looks like on the cross with the blood that was shed for us, suffering the pain for us, asking, asking his father to forgive us. In that way, because, because, of, because he's so kingly, because he's so majestic in that way, because there's no other king that we would rather serve, that's why we willingly, volitionally come to serve the Lord. And that is the kingdom of God. Wherever a person like that is, and when people are like that gathered together, that is the kingdom of God. May it be the case, brothers and sisters, every ordinary Sunday, that is not ordinary when we're gathered together, In worship, amen? Amen? Amen. There's a tremendous advantage of the kingdom of God not being physically limited. The subjects of the kingdom of God, in other words, the children of God can be in any any political, geographical territory or situation. We can be even hidden under the absolute tyrannical ruler of, of North Korea, some monarchies of of Africa or even near Saudi Arabia. The children of God can live there and we can all pray in secret to our Father who knows what our needs are. That is the reality of the kingdom of God. It is all pervasive. There is no corner of the world that it can, that that God's reach is out. You know, His reach will always reach those those places because that's that's what the gospel is all about. That's what the mission of God is. Anywhere we have the people who love God and is willing to follow Him, anywhere we have Jesus Christ being Lord is the kingdom of God. Therefore, I want to say that we are in the kingdom of God right now as we speak. Look at what Jesus says again about the kingdom of God. In uh, Matthew 13, verse 33, The kingdom of heaven is like what happens when a woman mixes a little yeast into three big batches of flour. Finally, all the dough rises. It's a peculiar, it's a kind of a, you know, kind of a interesting, it's an interesting illustration, right? How many of you do a little baking? Like, have you ever, like, knead dough and, like, made pizza or something like that? Anybody? Nobody has done that? Okay. So I have a son. You guys all know, met Jonathan, right? Good boy. And he, he really loves to, to bake, you know? Like, geez, where did you get that? But he loves the process because, you know, he's kind of like a very methodical and analytical. He loves to be just putting all the, measuring all the ingredients and he puts a little bit of the, the brewer's yeast or baker's yeast and he, and he makes the, you know, he makes this delicious, delicious bread. If it, one of these days, have, have him make a, na- whenever he makes naan bread, I'm going to have you guys come over to my house and then we'll have a little Mediterranean feast. But the thing is, you put a little bit of this yeast, and there is something mysterious that's going on. From the times of Jesus when this was written, nobody knew the chemical properties of what's actually going on. All you guys like, who are in the natural sciences, majoring in natural sciences, you guys know what's going on, right? But they didn't know. So as this agent, rising agent, is mixed into the dough very thoroughly, all pervasive, the final effect is that it rises and it makes a completed thing of one flower. I mean, a completed piece of bread that's all risen and nice and toasty and ready to eat. I want you to think about this message that Jesus came to preach about the kingdom of God and, and how, the, how the gospel was preached. In the initial, in the initial uh, steps, it was only 12 disciples. He just 
gather, he just gathered up 12 really nobodies, no influential people, no people of power. Like there was a tax collector. There was a fisherman and a couple of his, you know, brothers and buddies, right? Like really like just laborers, maybe if you want to call them blue collar, manual laborers, workers, he gathered together and after some time passed, namely like 2,000 years, in 2020, just last year, Christianity is reported to have 2.38 billion adherents around the world. That's 31.11%. That's almost one-third of the globe who know who Jesus is. It all began very small. It's a very small batch. It's a small bit of a yeast that was working for 2,000 years, and now... One third of the globe know who Jesus is. And from that vast number, whenever and wherever we see a person or a group of people who love Jesus and are willing to obey him, we are in the midst of witnessing how the kingdom of God is not a hope of a distant future, but a present reality today. When you look at the news today, it looks pretty bleak. It does. Because all, all that sells, you know, all, whenever, we watch, whenever we watch like drama or whatever, there's always suspense and conflict. This is what we, that's, what we, that's what our sinful nature likes to watch. But let me tell you, the kingdom of God is at hand. The first message that John the Baptist preached was, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's 2,000 years of this portion of the Lord's Prayer being prayed. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know why we pray that, right? Why we pray that we want things done here on earth as it is in heaven. There's only one thing that I could tell you that is the major difference is that in heaven, there is no sin up there. There is no sin up there. The average Christian, even in your, in your best holy walk, in, in your best week, best day, right? You have, you have this sin that you may be struggling with, but, and it's naggingly interfering with the total ruling of God in your life. We ask ourselves, how come God doesn't have a total rule in my life? Why do I have to be lazy? Why can't I forgive that other person, right? But in the total ruling of God, which is up in heaven, it's because there's no sin up there. And that's what we're praying. We're constantly praying, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let there be the path of the least resistance for us so that you will be done in my life. Because I know that your will is much better than mine for my own life. Once you surrender to God in that way, you see the kingdom of God unfold before your eyes as a reality. And you see where he leads you and he means for you to have a bright future and has a, has a purpose and a meaning, a plan, a great plan for your life. Because in the kingdom of God, you are significant. You are significant in the kingdom of God. On earth, we're still contending with sin and rebellion, and particularly those of who are not saved. Remember yesterday, uh, last Sunday, we talked about Jesus who says to love your, love your neighbors, but go above and beyond that. Love your enemies, right? Wow, that's a pretty tall order. But that is, that, it turns out that's, that's the plan. That's the, that is the strategy. That's the military strategy that, that he has issued to us. Because all the people that are not saved are still under the dominion of the evil one. The people that are not saved, they still think that this, the God of this world, Satan, is God. You know, they're totally mistaken. They have not broken into or they have not had the, the reality of the kingdom of God break into their lives and shine that bright light into their into the darkened souls. I pray that everybody at Miracle Land Baptist Church will be able to get a taste of heaven every single time we come to worship. Instead of being like self-conscious about who may be looking at me, do I look silly? Just raise your lift your hands high when you praise and you sing your heart out. Whether you, you're, you're you know, singing off-key, who cares? If it's off-tempo, just sing your heart out because of the reality of whom it is that we're worshiping. Amen. I'll conclude today's message with a third point. If you go to the slide, the kingdom of God. And the third point, it, it unpacks a little further, but the, the first point, our, you know, our king is good. 
if you've seen all the bad kings in, in even the good kings in history, you know, human beings, our king is the only really, like, truly good. The second one is the kingdom is, is, uh, is transcendent. You know, it's not just, you know, it's none of this world, right? The third one is the kingdom of God is a messianic kingdom. And this is something that is disclosed when we look at the, the Lord's Prayer. And when I say that it's a messianic kingdom, it's referring to the word Messiah. You guys know what Messiah means, the word Messiah? I mean, if you want to get technical, it means the anointed one. Messiah and Christ, they're, they're synonyms. But the connotation that the word Messiah has is it's about salvation. It's the, the, the one who, is, who has the unction, one, one who has been oiled, one who has been anointed is the one that comes to save the day, like, in the back, like back in the times of Judges. And when we talk about messianic kingdom, we're talking about a kingdom of, a sal- of salvation by a savior. Namely, to, to, to us, we, we know his identity, we know his name, it's Jesus Christ. In the Lord's Prayer, we get the constant reminders of how things are in the kingdom of God. His will being done on earth as it is in heaven, this includes his sustenance. Go to the next slide. It has to do with salvation. Next, one more. Sustenance. Give us this day our daily bread, it reads, right? When we're asking that to our God, it's because sometimes, like in our society, there are those who are competent. They're gifted with more talents than other people. Some people have more looks. Some people have, like, uh, more skills. So it's, it's disparate. It's not like all equal, right? It's all different. But uh, what we come to realize is that whether you have the gifts or don't have the gifts, if you have the physical strength or not have the physical strength, all of these things are still contingent on us having the daily drive and the motivation to carry it out. There are those days when you don't, when you feel like you can't get out of bed because whatever fatigue, whatever spiritual pressure that's pressing upon you, you know, if you have the scissor locks or whatever. I mean, there are people that are just having a difficult time just because everyday reality is such a hard thing. So when we say, give us day, this day our daily bread, we're signaling and we're seeking our good king who sustains us, God who provides Unlike the human kings who will demand things from us, we have the reverse of the situation where the king provides for us what we need. It is the good king that gives us the energy and the motivation to do our work, even if it's hard work putting in the long hours. And most of the times, when we are serving the king, when we are actually doing our task not for us but for him, we get tremendous joy in our hearts. Is that enough of a bread for us? Absolutely. Can that carry us for another week? Yes, for another year. Look at what, uh, look at what Jesus says in John 4, 20, 32. Uh, they're talking about food. And Jesus says, But he said to them, his disciples, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And the disciples are looking at each other. Did he go buy some food? Where, where, where did he get the food? And then he and he says, Jesus completes that, that thought. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. On that segue, the next slide is in the kingdom of God. If you go to the next slide, David, is forgiveness. And forgive us our debts. Forgive us what we owe to you as we also forgive those who owe us. Have you guys ever owed somebody an apology? Have you ever felt like you owe, owe uh, the person your love? Right? Have you done some, somebody some wrong that you need to repay for? Or have you had somebody that had done you wrong where they need to repay you? Right? The whole activity about what the salvation entails in our prayer and also in the kingdom of God, the business of God is to forgive us. When you know that the kingdom of God is at hand is when forgiveness is happening. Remember when the, Jesus was healing the people? After he heals the people, what does he say? He says, your sins are forgiven, and the people are like offended. Who can, who can forgive sins except for God? Well, 
That's exactly the point that he wanted to make. He's like being very, very almost elusive and kind of downplaying his identity. He's forgiving sins because he has the authority by the Father because he's the king in the kingdom of God that is inaugurating. When we talk about forgiving us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors, the debt that we owe to God may vary from person to person, even in this room right here. While some people who have sinned more may owe God more, and those who have sinned less may owe less. I don't know if you remember when Jesus said, whoever has been forgiven much loves much, and whoever has been forgiven little loves little. That is truly between God and each person. But what Jesus does in his prayer is to link God's forgiveness of me to my forgiveness of the other. In our hearts that we cannot see with our own eyes, there is a spiritual life that we live. We may have everything look pretty cool on the surface, everything smooth, you know, everything panned out as a straight, but there's things, entanglements in our ex internal, interior, in our lives that are not seen. Only God knows, and you at some deep level are aware of. There is an inextricable relationship between our forgiveness of our neighbors and his forgiveness of us. I don't think Jesus is placing a condition on our salvation. He's not saying, you got to forgive that person for, in order for you to be saved. That's not, I don't think that's what he's saying. I think, we're, I think we're called to do what seems impossible because he did the impossible thing. He did the impossible thing to forgive us our sins and to bring us from the domain of darkness of the evil one into his domain of light. He rescued us in that way. And that is at the center, at the crux of the kingdom reality, the kingdom of God. Are you a forgiving person? Or do you have to get your payback? Do you have to have the last word in? Are you able to let it go just because of the king we serve? The next element in, the, in how the kingdom of God is messianic in this prayer that we see is that there's guidance. We ask. We're able to ask for guidance from God. One of the ways to describe somebody who is not saved, we say that he or she is lost, right? Have you guys ever, when you were little, have you ever gotten lost somewhere? Somewhere unfamiliar and it was like a pretty frightening experience? I shared this story with, my, with the youth group earlier, but I remember when I was like five, six years old, probably before, probably around like preschool or like, kindergarten it goes way back I mean I'm surprised I even remember this but it was a traumatic experience so I'm like walking the busy markets of Seoul like in the I don't know like maybe late 70s early 80s long time ago right and I'm holding tightly to my mother's hand and I'm walking with her in this very busy marketplace and I don't know how this happened but I think we were separated just briefly like our hands were let go and the next thing I notice when I'm reaching up to grab this woman's hand, this lady's like, whoa, she's like scared, <laughs> like some strange kid's trying to grab her hand. And I'm like, wow. And by the way, I started crying, bursting into tears because I can't find my mother. And I'm lost in the sea of people in the midst of a, a busy marketplace. Of course, you know, I was uh, led to the local, like a police, like a little station, you know, and uh, Moments later, my mom came to find me, so we were reunited. But, but now I want you to imagine that scenario at a spiritual level. At a spiritual level, where you're lost. You have no idea where you're going. You're searching, and you're like in a labyrinth, in a maze, trapped, finding no way out. Guidance. In the kingdom of God, our king gives us, grants us guidance. If you remember, going all the way back to Genesis, humanity fell into the domain of sin because of Eve being tempted by the serpent, right? That's how the whole mess began. There was one prohibition. God says, you could 
freely do all this, but just don't do this one thing. That's what they did because the serpent said, did God really say don't do all these things? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. To lead us not into temptation is, is, is to ask him, always be before us so that we be being led, led towards you, not away from you. you know, the reason why we, we pray these things is because life in this world presents itself with temptations. And temptations to sin unto death. And to seek the kingdom of God is to seek the only good king who guides us and helps us avoid temptation, to flee as we run towards him. That's the, that's the final condition would, which would lead us to a final the deliverance from evil. Deliverance from evil. That's, that's what amounts to salvation. The clutches of the evil one on your souls is, no long, is now out of reach. Satan is trying to do this and trying to still, you know, Satan is trying to do it, but that's it. You know, there's like the bar- barrier now. Jesus said, no, they're mine, you know. I took them. I paid for them with my blood. What are you going to do about it? That is, that is the reality that's going on right now when we're talking about the kingdom of God. The last slide, David, deliverance. Deliverance. But deliver us from the evil one. The kingdom of God that Jesus came to preach and to set in motion, to inaugurate, to start, is one that is salvific. The reason why the church has been persisting and, and Christianity has been growing to the, to the numbers I gave you earlier is because this salvation, the process of souls being saved and found, the lost souls that were blind that are now able to see coming to the reality of the kingdom of God, that has not stopped. You know, in the United States, when I come to, you know, the Korean American churches, even if you go to like a Latino, Latino American church, you'll see a lot of people wanting that that coveted citizenship of the United States, the document, the papers, you know, green card, right? But in the citizenship of the kingdom of God, which is not restricted to the, the temporal and the physical, we are granted in ourselves the salvation from the Messiah. It's a messianic kingdom. We get the sustenance, the drive, the motivation to want to live another day with gusto. Number two, we get forgiveness. The weight and the burden that we used to carry that was like an iron cross that was crushing our souls, we have, we're able to lift it out of the way. We're able to extend our hardened hearts and to extend an olive branch to the person that, that I was hating earlier yesterday and to make peace, to seek forgiveness and to accept and to give forgiveness, accept the apology. Guidance. Whereas we were like fumbling in the dark, you know, in, a, in, in the dark, a blind man fumbling in the dark, you know, looking for a light switch that is not there. We're seeing the Almighty God guiding us through that voice, guiding us through the truth of His Word every day. And finally, deliverance. Deliverance from evil. I pray that none of us here, none of us here will be uh, succumbing to that, to that temptation that we would be entirely, every single one of us delivered, no souls left behind, that each and every one of us would seek, would have our hearts seek God as our good king to serve as we are in the kingdom of God. May each of us come to know our heavenly father as our good king and to be eager to serve him because there is, no, there is not one king that I would rather serve. There is no other king that I would, I would rather serve. Um, I will close with this one illustration that's kind of compelling in regards to the kingdom of God leaving its blueprints and its marker through, through forgiveness. And this is something that happened a couple of years back, back in October um, you guys, I don't know if you remember a Dallas woman. She's a female police officer by the name of Amber Geiger. You guys remember who that is? Kind of vaguely remember. Just a few years back. What happened was she was an off-duty police officer, and she came into her own apartment complex. And I don't know if she was drunk or just really tired or what, but she went inside the wrong apartment thinking that it was her own. 
and she found a man, a black man, eating ice cream while watching TV. She withdrew her weapon and she killed that man. And uh, later on, she was charged with manslaughter because, I mean, it, uh, it, was, it was not premeditated. It was not like she, she hadn't planned it. But after the arraignment and the judge and the jury gave her a 10-year sentence, there was a, an incredible display of Christian forgiveness as the deceased um, Botham Jean was the, one, the man who was shot. His younger brother, 18-year-old Brant Jean, Uh, stood up and uh, came up to the uh, woman and asked for um, for permission. Can I come and uh, can I come forward and, and hug you? And this this man held her for about a minute in silence, and he said, "I forgive you." And he said, I love you as a person, and I don't wish anything bad on you. That is the kingdom of God. There is <laughs> this critical race theory. There's all these you know, the the theoretical people that are like arguing about how to, how to mend the social issues of race and reconciliation. This. Human beings can't come even, cannot come close to what happens when the kingdom of God breaks into the reality of a person who had someone very precious taken away from him and has, has a drive, the impetence from up there to be able to say, I forgive you. And he says, I love you as a person. I don't wish anything bad upon you. Today, this afternoon, when we want to ask of ourselves, how do you want your Christian life to be, to be navigated? What's the path that you want to walk? What is a narrow gate that may be prescribed to you in your immediate future? I want you to think about the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is when we're calling upon the living Lord, our God, as King in the kingdom that we're willing to serve gladly because He's so worthy of of our allegiance and our loyalty. Can you think of anyone that is deserving of your loyalty in that way? Nah, not even close. I pray to each and every one, to, for each and every one of you, that, that you will just be like those, <laughs> those I'm, a pain, I'm a pain in romantic picture, your girls and guys, you'll be like the knights in the shining armor that's kneeling before the throne, and he will, he will knight you with the sword of the Spirit. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us a glimpse of what it means that we serve the kingdom of God. And, and when we say the kingdom of God, who you are, our king. And uh, as, as we call you king, Lord, as we make this confession, Lord, let our loyalties be firm and uh, let that foundation, Lord, be upon which we're able to do everything in the great joy that you allow us. Give us humble hearts, for you are a humble king. Give us, Lord, uh, power because you are a powerful king. And just like we have seen in this, in this news, something that happened not too long ago of this incredible extend, extension of, of, of truth, of love and forgiveness, May we be able to live as those, as principles by which we live. The, the, the very thing that we are agents of as being ambassadors of your kingdom for your name and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Now at this time we have a time of praise and response after which we will have offering.